communication. Mass communication. From the centralized creation and control of the message to its consumption by large audiences, at every turn, from the printing press to the present, we have found ways to accelerate the duplication and distribution of information and entertainment. In every era, new communications technologies have had profound and lasting effects on individuals and society. That new communications technologies will change society is predictable, but to even begin to understand how, we must first understand media history. As we have moved, grown from nomadic tribes, to farms, to urban dwellers, our means of communication have advanced along with us. Over the years, how we communicate has been an important measure of our development into a complex society. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit JIU.edu to find out more. If you go back through the history of communication, you can trace some of these revolutions. For example, the discovery of an alphabet, the discovery of writing, the discovery of the printing press, the discovery of electronic media. Before writing, we have a rich heritage of oral culture. We have storytellers, creators, and we have traveling minstrels. The kind of mass communication that you had before, uh, writing became widespread, and uh, 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 that really doesn't occur until after printing. Um, took the form of somebody standing up and speaking as loudly as possible. So the art of oratory that was so ent very important in the medieval period or in classical times begins to diminish in importance after printing. What the printing press did um, was make the possibility of the amplification of the message larger. And by amplification I mean the capacity for one speaker to reach many listeners or receivers because it makes, what it did was make possible the reproduction of exact copies of a message for distribution to many people. What was difficult before the printing press was the, the production of many copies of that message. Um, certainly they did copy messages, you know, the, the scribes, um, monks who, who produced copies of manuscripts, but it was very laborious, very time consuming. Um, it was very difficult to make very many copies and it was practically impossible to make exact duplicates because in the process of transcribing, we know now from looking at that history, the message changed. There was always a process of interpretation that went on there so that over time a text would not remain identical. The printing press makes identical copies, multiple identical copies possible. Something else was going on, however, as well, that is tied almost from day one back at the, the rise of the Gutenberg newspapers or the Carantos of the 16th and 17th century that carries on into the industrial period, which was there was a very strong commercial drive associated with, with the printing press as well. Some of the first um, one-sheet uh, newspapers really weren't about politics or even religion at all. They were about business news. They were the uh, shippers in Antwerp wanting to know when the boats were coming in from London and, and what, what the manifest, the cargo manifests held, what the prices were for particular goods in, in different ports around, around Europe. So it's very, very interesting that the mass communication, the origins of mass communication are very much tied to a fundamental kind of commercial process as well. And people would actually pay for this information because it was very valuable to their, to their enterprises. Through the mass production of print materials to reach broad audiences, the concept of mass communication arose and took on definition. First through printing presses, then steam, then high-speed presses, we increased our ability to rapidly create identical copies of information. In the United States, 
The mass communication concept was built on the 19th century industrial factory model. Centralized mass production for large general audiences. The notion that this new industrialized form of communication, whether it was print or whether it was film or ultimately radio and television, could be thought of as a product to be bought and sold. And that was very much, I think, a major change in the notions of communication that the industrialized period made possible. Again, not a, not a new idea entirely. It was there from the early days, back in the, the, the 15th and 16th century at least. But it became more salient. It became a bigger portion of it. So it's a broad sweep of changes that takes place both in the technology and in the social and cultural interactions with them. And those changes emerge over a period of time. They aren't overnight. With the industrial age, as manufacturing brought mass production and distribution, technology added more mass to the concept of mass communication, starting with a simple device that did no more than convey electrical impulses over a copper wire. The telegraph is, is the beginning of what we think of as sort of the electronic electrification of communication. And what it did was separate transportation from communication because before the telegraph while we had the capacity to mass reproduce a message with the printing press the movement of that information was restricted to whatever technologies existed to move people and goods across the land across geography so that the pace the uh, the speed at which messages could travel were dependent on what were the existing states of the technologies of transportation. The importance of telegraphy was enormous and we think of ourselves as living in a society that changes very rapidly but consider what it was like to live in a society that before telegraphy the upper ceiling on the speed of the movement of any message or any person was the horse. Uh, telegraphy changed this totally and made it possible to move messages in ways that were previously unheard of, which seemed utterly magic. So telegraphy represented a real important shift in people's um, sense of the size of the world and, and uh, who could be talked to and who they could talk to and so on. When the telegraph was first invented, it was looked upon as a device to improve public morality and public education and to uplift the entire American continent. All of a sudden, the greatest minds in the country could talk to each other instantaneously over a wire. Think of the benefits of that if you brought together the, the best scholars in the nation and hooked them up to the telegraph. Imagine the tremendous things they could invent and discuss and come up with. Well, that's phase one. Phase two is when the medium doesn't exactly live up to its tremendous potential. With regard to the telegraph, it eventually became a, a means of commerce. Uh, keeping the trains running on time, sending stock quotations back and forth. The telegraph also made it possible for newspapers to pool resources and begin to exchange information, hence the development of the wire services, um, so that you didn't have to have reporters stationed all over the place. You could rely on newspapers in another city to give you information about what's going on there via the telegraph in exchange for your doing the same thing. That effort uh, made it much more possible for people simultaneously to be getting more or less uh, the same uh, the same information uh, in, in, in quite uh, dispersed uh, places. And that may have been one of the most important developments uh, that in, that occurred in in creating this kind of notion of a mass uh, communication capacity. Once information traveled around the globe almost instantaneously, it was only a matter of time before human speech would follow. In the United States, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone ushered in point-to-point -point communication, but also helped pave the way for one-to-many voice communication. With the development of the technical capacity to transmit voice, and that comes out of the development of the telephone, we begin to think, okay, we've got the telephone, we've got the telegraph. Now these two things together, why not put those together and send voice across airwaves so that radio is conceived as a wireless telegraph with this point-to-point -point use 
and, the, um, and getting rid of the problem of the wires that have to be maintained, that you have to put underneath the ocean, and so on. Um, radio begins that way, and it only later develops into what we think of as radio being used as mass communication, a message produced, in, you know, centrally produced someplace, and then transmitted to many people at once. We're but straws in the wind. I shall leave you two to talk this off. I'm sorry, Mrs. Black. There's no use talking. You must give him up. You dare to talk to me like that, you love thief. One of the, the large corporations involved with the development of radio, um, AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph, was also thinking about this new medium. And because of the prior uses of the telephone and the telegraph, conceived as these point-to-point -point forms of communication, it's, it's called toll, the uh, toll notion, T-O-L-L, -L, which is we provide only the means of communication. We don't care what the message is. We will sell you access to the means of communication and you decide what you want to send. Hence the idea of people wishing to sell something, a service, a product, buying the means of access to an audience. Ask for McTavish's in the giant economy tin at your favorite grocer's. Tonight or tomorrow, sure. Remember the name, McTavish. And now, friends, for our next... Long before radio became so pervasive, most people left their homes several times per week to go to the movies for entertainment. In the 1950s, however, a new source of visual entertainment invaded American homes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Within a decade, television was the dominant medium of mass communication. Television then becomes more widely available to the populace on what we would call almost a demand basis, very, very quickly. I mean, the, you know, the television is not widely available in the mid-1940s. By 1960, in the United States, it's an 80 to 85 percent of the households, maybe pushing 90 percent uh, by the mid-1960s. So it, it takes us over very, very quickly. The, the difference between it and the movies at that point uh, as a, uh, as a, as a uh, basic technology course is that you and I can have it in the household uh, relatively. We don't have to go anywhere uh, to participate in it. In the early days of television, and actually for the first um, two or three decades of television, it was definitely what we would think of as a mass medium. It is an oligopoly of three networks with no challengers. I mean, we have educational television, which is this distant, distant, marginalized alternative. Those three networks, basically, are all looking for the same thing, which is this notion of the homogenized mass audience. The bigger, the better. ABC didn't sound a lot different than CBS or NBC, just on the news value alone. Similarly, on the entertainment and the storytelling, uh, you know, um, action, adventure, cop shows, westerns, whatever the uh, the entertainment were, they were really quite common across the networks as well. That it created a kind of a national cultural experience, but within a fairly limited range of possibilities. From a solid infrastructure in the early years, television networks saw their revenues and market share erode as new communications technologies successfully competed for the time and attention of diminishing mass audiences. Keep in mind, back in the 1970s, the, the VCR, the video cassette recorder, um, actually spread to households about as fast as television sets spread back during the 1950s. It was a tremendous success. And with that came, of course, your own handheld mini cam that you could go out and shoot the family on the weekends. You could watch those tapes in there. That took away from network viewing. You could go down to the local video store and rent a movie or something. That took away from network viewing. 
uh, Nintendo came out with video games, and uh, the kids, of course, played the video games over the television set. That took away from network viewing. You also had your independent stations putting some stuff on the air that uh, was popular once on the networks and still had some popularity. So the networks were, in effect, competing against themselves as some of the reruns on the independent stations took away some of their own audience. So there were a number of factors that uh, chewed away at the network audience size. Perhaps, by more than anything, network television was undermined, not by some other communication media, but by more television. Arriving first by copper wire strung over mountaintops, then to the suburbs, and later by satellite to everyone, everywhere. Cable raises the issue of a broader spectrum capacity. It starts to do that in the late 60s and the early 70s when it begins to dawn on people that if you had something like a coaxial cable or ultimately a fiber optic distribution system, you wouldn't be limited to as few frequencies as we are in what we call erroneously over the air uh, broadcasting. So the notion that you could have more television or radio stations, I mean, vastly uh, more of them, uh, becomes a new idea. With the launching of uh, satellites in the mid-70s and the use of them by HBO and uh, Ted Turner with, with WTBS, uh, we have a very cheap and efficient way of distributing information nationally. And thus, it's at that point, when that technology is in place, that we have the explosion of the MTVs, ESPNs, CNNs, all, its, all of these, basically launching in the late 70s, early 80s. And this radically alters the communication environment because people are no longer tied to broadcast television, which is designed to appeal to as many people as possible. And we develop niche services such as MTV, which appeal to only a narrow demographic audience. And now we're on into things like the Golf Channel, the History Channel, etc., which are not broadcast in the sense of reaching a broad audience. They are narrowcast. They're intended for narrow audiences. And this really alters the way in which we think about cable and the way in which we think about broadcast television. So there's a lot of competition. And increasingly, that you see this kind of organization around carving out pieces of that mass audience. Well, we will, you know, this network will say, well, we're interested in Fox, for example, develops, organized around carving out a piece of the mass audience, young people who seem to be underserved by the big three networks, we will produce programming to attract them, siphon off from these other two. Then the other two start trying to, the other three try to start differentiating themselves in terms of, um, well, um, how do we carve out around a particular gender or a particular racial or ethnic group? Um, you know, so you get one network on Monday night has got, you know, ABC has football. All right, we're, we're going for the men. The other network says, okay, let's counter-program. Let's go for the women. Let's have Murphy Brown. Let's have the series of the, the women-oriented sitcoms. So there's this kind of um, fragmentation of the mass audience. Everybody's looking to carve out a piece. The thing I think we need to remember is that even when you carve out a chunk, we're still talking about audiences in enormous numbers, enormous numbers. Despite the fact that more and more media are reaching narrower and narrower audiences, they may be serving the same basic functions that they always have. I'm not sure that the rapid growth in the number of television channels, particularly in cable television, um, is having any substantive effect on what we watch. It is clearly fragmenting audiences. Uh, you can now watch news 24 hours a day if you want. But if you actually look at the news, it's not much different than the news you see on CBS for half an hour. You just see it all day long. So the content of television has not changed much more. Uh, it's changed much. It's just that you can get any one piece of it a lot more. So there's more of it, but it's not substantially changed. Bruce Springsteen said 54 channels and nothing on. There's something to that. Cable television in the 1980s and direct-to-home satellites in the 1990s opened up a multi-channel world of information and entertainment. 
On desktops, the World Wide Web connected the world and put a new kind of communication power in the hands of groups and individuals. Now, traditional media are converging with new media to create an ever-expanding universe of communication. If you think of the television screen as something that is married now to the computer as well and has the same sources of information available to it that we can now get on the Internet, combine those two things and you begin to see a world of information the likes of which nobody has ever had access to before. And we're just beginning to play with that potential. So that um, I think what you need to do is get your head around the notion that where we had discrete forms of the transmission of entertainment, information, movies, what have you, we are now slowly but surely coming into a system where it's all going to come through one channel. And those of us sitting wherever we're sitting, in the workplace, at home, probably walking along with the earphones on and watching something, that kind of thing, we can have any piece of information, any piece of entertainment we want anywhere in the world, anytime we want to get it. That's a, that's a wild notion, but it's a real notion in terms of the kind of technology we have available to deliver that to us now. And what that means is you will be able to log on to the Internet, or whatever we call it, and access video programs, television programs, as well as textual sources of information. At that point, you will begin putting together your own television programs, your own sequences. If you want to see what a filmmaker in Sweden has to say about something, you simply dial his web page. You're not dependent on saying at 7 o'clock what's on. You can find anything you want at any time. But beyond that, uh, people will be able to communicate with video back to you, almost like a video telephone system for filmmakers and television producers. If and when we get to that stage, um, what I watch will be completely different than what you may watch because I'm make, making different choices. The profusion of media alternatives are changing not just the lives of individuals, but of traditional mass media corporations. We're in an enormous period of transition uh, in the mass media uh, system um, for in, in a number of different ways. First, I would say that we're going through a period of fractionalization which is since the late 1970s, uh, uh, over the last decade and a half and more, we're going through a period of fractionalization in which more and more media channels are being offered to people in the United States and also around the world. So fractionalization is a big thing. The second big change is globalization. The media are increasingly a global phenomenon, and media conglomerates are increasingly global entities, and not just American entities. Um, and so today, anyone who works in an upper-level position within the media has to understand that companies make their revenues not just within the United States, but particularly in the audiovisual media like television and movies, foreign markets are incredibly important. So we have fractionalization, we have globalization, and we also have conglomerization. Conglomerization is a a phenomenon that has been building steam over the last several decades. But media conglomerates, uh, more and more in the last 15, 20 years, uh, have become very interested in moving their material across media boundaries. It used to be that each part of what is now the giant communications or telecommunications industry was a discrete industry, so that you had the movie industry, the television industry, the computer industry, the telephone industry, all of them were separate. They tended to be dealt with by regulators who dealt with them each on their own. What's happened now is that the boundaries between sectors have eroded. Executives in the media, particularly at the higher levels, know that the boundaries between media industries are blurring. For a person who's not interested in going into media, it's still terribly important to understand media industries because these are the organizations that create an environment of symbols that surround us. Most of what we talk about every day, most of what we see about the world every day is filtered through media. It's filtered through companies that, that basically construct worlds for us. 
It's not like these worlds are not true, but the worlds are constructed because of um, constraints, because of rewards that companies get, because of concer concerns that they have that are out there and that we have to know, we have to understand in order to be able to say, hey, we're, we're not going to totally be pawns of a, of a world we, don't, we know nothing about. Um, being an educated individual means being aware of how your environment gets created. And the media are such an important part of that environment, I can't imagine someone not wanting to know how the media world gets created. In the near future, it appears that media will continue to merge and grow and profoundly impact culture, just as each new communications medium has in the past. By knowing the history of mass media, we are better able to understand how media impacts our lives and transforms society. Knowledge TV Retro, brought to you by Jones International University, the first fully online accredited university. Change your life for the better on your schedule. Eight-week classes begin next month. Visit jiu.edu to find out more.